My name is Ben Verinder. I'm a Chartered Public Relations Practitioner. Um, I run a, what is really a specialist research agency. We were commissioned by uh, BIS and the CIPR last year to do this piece of research. So I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, I'm actually going to, results-wise, because it's all in the public domain and it's published on the CIPR website, um, I'm going to go through the results relatively quickly. Uh, I'm going to point out right from the beginning is that this, this was a qualitative and quantitative study of people's opinions. But there were some very wise opinions in there. Um, I'll, so I'll take you through sort of what the research was, um, <clears throat> who we talked to, and why we did it. It was a brainchild of a lady called Sue Walsenholm, who was the CRPR president for 2013-14. And Sue was particularly interested in science PR as a focus for the CRPR, and particularly looking at the challenges facing science communicators. And also this sort of um, division between public relations and communication, science communication and, and public uh, awareness of, of, of uh, scientific endeavour versus um, corporate and organisational objectives and sort of this nexus about truth in science as well. And really it was looking to support professional practice and it was a sort of, um, supposed to be the platform for further study so we're not trying to overclaim for it in terms of a uh, piece of research. So what it involves is quite a big, hefty contextual review, which involved about 20 interviews with uh, senior practitioners from around the world, um, which is really just to understand the landscape. Uh, and also, as you would expect from a contextual review, it wasn't a literature review because it wasn't the size of PR practitioners. Were. It was quite a lot less than some membership bodies would have you believe, actually. It's quite interesting. And we're also able to see which of those worked in scientific organisations. problem with that, though, is it doesn't give us the number of science PR or communicators because actually you could be working in a, in a university um, and that wouldn't necessarily be classified as a science comprehensive um, enough to be called that actually. It was more setting the scene and, and asking some particular questions that would set the primary research. Primary research for the field work was February, May 2014 um, with, so what were the stuff that came out of contextual review? There's a significant tradition in talking about science communication and particularly um, public awareness and public attitudes to science um, that focuses on traditional media. So if you 30 plus senior practitioners, so that would be comms directors of agencies, big scientific organisations, some research councils, governments. Public understanding of science is still, in the social and digital age, still uh, dominated by television media. Um, uh, to a m more significant extent than you might think, particularly television news and uh, TV documentaries. We had some major issues in the beginning because actually we didn't really have a database of uh, science communicators, so we had to establish our own. So, um, you know, amongst all of our sort of conversations about digital and social, it's worth bearing that in mind and your own work and how you, you know, the wider ambition. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the critiques of science communications and science PR and the way people do it uh, typically focus on the fact that the media liaison isn't good enough or it's unethical in places, etc. So at the beginning we thought that that was a bit misplaced and a bit old hat, but actually they've got a point if public understanding is driven by, by TV. There was a lot in the literature in, about this conflict between public interest and public relations and lots of examples and lots of studies, particularly from Germany, about conflicts of interest where, well, let's look at, oh, let's look at Volkswagen, for instance. <laughs> yeah. So we're not going anywhere, are we? No. So the ethics of um, scientific accuracy and, and whether you are, if you are beholden to represent, if you're a follower of Robert Peston and you think that we're all, I'm going to use a swear word because it's, it's his word, bullshitters, if you're in public relations, that is, as opposed to communicating scientific science, which, which, which house you're in. You know, uh, is there a necessary conflict between the uh, aims and objectives of your organisation and um, pure objective communication of scientific fact and accuracy? Now, in the there was another thing that came out of the literature review that was uh, the contextual review that was really powerful, which were <coughs> a split in the approaches of organisations and their thoughts about owned channels. So, I'll give you an example, Imperial probably know has a sort of has developed its website to the point where it's basically its own publishing house if you ever go to see the Imperial website and it's it's circumventing in some ways earned channels such as traditional media now its argument is actually it's not circumventing it's complementing those and there's a there's a lot there's a lot of argument in the modern literature about whether about 
the epics of this, and also the efficacy of it, in the sense of uh, if you have a mediated message, so one that goes through the sort of the mangling machine of, a, of an independent journalist, does that guard against uh, ethical problems? Or is it the case that actually journalists take your stuff and turn it into, uh, they actually take you know, good scientific communication and turn it into stuff that, in, that is confusing to the public or misleading to the public? It's worth pointing out at the moment, does anybody here know about the Cardiff study that's being undertaken at the moment by the School of Journalism, Schools of Journalism and Psychology in Cardiff? Okay, it's quite important for, probably for your work and worth, worth knowing about. There's a few papers actually, one which was done by the Science Media Centre, which was commissioned by the Science Media Centre, that Cardiff School of Journalism and Psychology have been involved in, and they're probably the best work on this area. There's a guy called uh, Sumner, uh, I can't remember his name, Chris, uh, I'll remember their names later on in a minute, but it basically combined together these schools of journalism and psychology to run a variety of different studies on science communication and public relations, and at the moment they're doing they're, try, they're, look, they're running a sort of experimental study about press releases. And it's worth raising this because they did a previous study where they did an analysis of media exaggeration of, of, of scientific stories, a so misrepresentation of certain parts of stories. And then they looked at the, and it was, uh, it was uh, based around press releases that had come from Russell Group Universities. So this is relevant to you guys as funders of you know, through the ref and everything else of these institutions and partners of these institutions. And to cut a long story short, they found that 75% of the prog appeared in media coverage of these stories was sourced back to the press release. It's really worth looking at this study. It's quite fundamental. Which means that the criticisms that are sometimes made by uh, organisations such as sometimes yourselves and universities of all oh, you nasty Daily Mail journalists, you take my, you know, this has happened in Leveson, this has happened in, you take my words and you turn and you simplify this into something is a bit shallow and a little bit misguided. Um, uh, anyway, the Cardiff study is now moved on to a second generation study and it's experimental, so they're trying to work out the difference between causality and correlation. And what they're doing is they're changing, with the permission of the universities, pre the same press release and they're changing some factors in it. And they're seeing the extent to which the media picks up on the changes, etc. So it's basically, so, and you know, some of the uh, surface details because it's a new study, but it's worth checking out. Okay, so uh, some overviews of the results of our study, uh, talking to all of these practitioners about the challenges that faces them. What we were delighted with was, that, was how commonplace ethical considerations were in your everyday life. In, this was independent of whether you work for an, uh, a PR agency or a public affairs agency that looked after scientific clients, or you work for, uh, you know, a manufacturer's of wind farms, or you work for a nuclear development company, or you work for a university or a research council, etc. I suppose this is to be expected, given the fact that actually there are so many ethical codes already in place in scientific practice, such as animal welfare, experimentation on animals. Um, uh, scientific communication um, codes of practice, actually. So, just to raise a point, it's, it's, it's sort of ethical considerations are endemic in practice. Most practitioners that we spoke to did not like the term public relations. They preferred to be known as communicators. But, if you study public relations, and you look at the definitions of public relations, and you look at Cutlip's definition of public relations activities, you'll see fully squarely and quite rightly that media relations, for example, is one of those activities. So we had lots of people who were doing public relations activities, which, you know, as per the normal definitions, but they weren't calling themselves public relations practitioners because they were embarrassed. And they were embarrassed or reluctant to take that mantle because their organisations thought that public relations was, to sum it up, a bit of a dirty word. And I suppose I suppose really this is the centre of this whole study. There were individuals and organisations that were, it was one, what's called, you know, it was one way asymmetrical communication. It was getting stuff out. It was publicity um, with a view to helping people understand things. It wasn't communicating. It wasn't public relations because it, it wasn't um, designed to affect relationships. It was just trying to tell people a fact, you know, go and get your jab. Go and get your, you know. So some of this activity really was pure... But a lot of it was public relations. It was about building up relationships mutual, to mutual, for mutual goodwill 
etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You know the CIPR definition and others, but pretty much they're all around relationships. The biggest source of ethical problems, according to respondents across the board, were confused or over complicated organisational objectives. I'll give you an example of this. So you're in a small university and you've got a particular specialism uh, or three or four specialisms and you're the press officer and you've, you're the press officer with responsibility let's say for uh, research communications at a tactical level. You've got these relationships with these scientists, so you, you've used the SM, the Science Media Centre, and a variety of other resources to train them all up to do TV, radio, and they're really good, etc. But you've got a pool of quite shallow research because you, your university only does a certain amount, as opposed to, let's say, the press office for nature, who's drowning in quality research. And yet, with that research, you've been tasked because your business development or your pro vice chancellor or your dean or your registrar doesn't really understand that this is not a good idea. You've been tasked with using that research to find sponsors, get funding, recruit students, uh, potential student applicants, discuss with alumni. You know, you're trying to do 20 different things with a piece of research. It, one would, and, there, and it's at those moments where the, the respondents, where we had respondents saying, that's when I did something I regretted. The solution, there's a brilliantly wise man who works in the university in London, and so, in the key, in the summary of the, that's online at CIPR, um, uh, if you go to this section, I, I recommend reading what he says because we keep we we published this quote in, in quite a lot of detail because it was really quite it summed up pretty much everything. He's a pretty wise bloke. He's a he's director of comms at the University of London, and he he talks a lot about the solution to this, which is being honest about why you're doing what you're doing. It's not about not doing it. It's about being absolutely straight with what you're using. So you, you know, you're clear in your, in your activity that we are using this scientific research for student recruitment. We are, uh, you know, and when, if there is a conflict between the objective of the organisation and, and uh, the public, not the public good, but public interest, that you're absolutely clear about it. And, but more, more importantly, that you're not trying to overclaim for stuff. So if you're, if you're using scientific activity for an organisational imperative and it's not really in the public interest, it's not unethical, but it's, then don't try and pretend that it is. Mm. Which I think is a very wise thing to say, really. There's another thing that worth pointing out is when we asked people what they thought their organisation did badly, the, the most common, um, which is good news for me because I run a research company, was that they the research amongst stakeholders. So organisations like yourselves, the thing that you think that you're not that good at is understanding in depth the views of your important <coughs> groups or publics or stakeholders, whatever word you want to use, about you. So it's a bit of stakeholder research, really, which is common. I mean, it's not. Internal challenges. Um, so these are the things that practitioners found um, most challenging about the organisations they worked? Well, basically science. It was only at the end of this project that we kind of worked out that mm. science is actually, is it arithmetical? Or it's, it's very nature, makes external communication very difficult for lots of different reasons. One, the nature of collaboration. So you have, it's generally a collaborative affair. So you have people um, who don't want to overclaim because they don't want to upset their friends and partners and colleagues, collaborators. Two, shoulders of giants, so precedence. Again, you don't want to overclaim because you realise as a scientist that actually you're building on a body of work. Three, the scientific process itself, which is often involves intellectual property considerations where you're not, you don't want to go da -da, early too early because you might lose your intellectual property advantage. But probably more commonly, you don't want to go da -da, too early because you're not sure about the results until it's actually firm and fast. That's part of science. Because you, you need to test. So in other words, it's the science scientist in his. People use various different phrases, but they, it was either cage, cave, lab, somewhere enclosed. You know, there was a lot of talk about scientists sort of hiding until they were ready, and sometimes they were never ready. You, yeah, remember that? You probably get that talk about it because it's really not finished. There was some talk about the nature of scientists themselves. There are scientists in this room, I know, uh, who might not be as extrovert as the average general population. I don't, I don't totally um, 
agree with that. But so uh, some of the some real challenges, which and the the conclusion for which, in our opinion, was that science communication and public relations is a specialism. You are specialists, and that for us was really important because it it brought out two of the later conclusions. It's not the same as other types of public relations and communication because it's, it's got certain things that are unique to it. Evaluation, that's one of the other challenges, which is that you're going into a room full of scientists and they've got scientists and you've got PR evaluation methods, which at their best, you know, there's lots of argument about. You know, even if you're using AMEC, what, Barcelona principles point two or whatever they are at the moment, you know, I was at a meeting the other day in which senior practitioners completely and utterly rubbished all public relations measurement as being pretty, you know, Neanderthal, and he's got a point. So you're going into a meeting with these people who are using a particular sort of well-developed, you know, from the Enlightenment methodology, and you're there with your, you know, with, with tools that might not look so impressive. Because you're a specialism, we think that you deserve specialist support, which I'll come on to later on. Other issues were just basically whether you've got enough money to do the job, particularly if, like this guy at the university press officer, you're trying to do 100 different things with a limited amount of material. And also there's all these channels cropping up like mushrooms on a wet Thursday in October. Um, you know, there's a new, there'll, be, there'll be a new one by the time you've left this room, you know. It's, oh, it's the Reddit, or it's the, you know, which, you're, which certain members of your team might be going, we've got to be in this channel, we've got to occupy the space, and dealing with all that and all these new challenges. But well, actually, some of that digital change provides quite significant opportunities, according to our respondents, for, for you guys, because you've got to, particularly with changes to the publishing landscape, you might have seen the stuff with Elsevier that's going on at the moment, and, and all this stuff about open access, etc. And, and the real challenge is actually with, with, um, in, the new sort of, in the new media landscape, and in, in sort of spinning up the scientific process, and what that means for scientists, and, the benefits and disadvantages for that. And practitioners that we spoke to, particularly senior practitioners, thought that, that was an, an opportunity for them rather than a problem. Some external challenges, so things that are happening in the environment that make life harder for you guys. I just mentioned it, the media landscape, particularly the, what we call the research avalanche, so just um, more research happening, more published, more out there, and you've got to sift through it. And you've got to do this brutal thing sometimes, particularly if you work in publishing, of going, 21 pieces of research, we're only going to take one. Yeah, and you know that 20 are worth publishing, but you're, you're, there's brutality about the process. It's a bit of a misconception, actually, that science um, media, science journalists have disappeared off the face of the earth. As you all know, because you probably deal with them regularly, they haven't, but they have shrunk. And what, and I'm sure you probably all know this as well, what's tended to happen is where they disappeared, that science, tip, that science reporting has gone to a generalist. And you probably all know this as well, that that generalist is not, good, not as good at persuading his or her news desk to run the story in the way that should be run. So that generalist might not have the clout within its organisation, within its newspaper particularly, to defend your line or represent you or get you in there or, or, or negotiate on your behalf or on behalf of scientific experts. So there, it was interesting to see how much um, specialist journalists were cherished by by people particularly in media liaison, and we could, we could understand that. There was a split down the middle between about social media, about, uh, about unmediated sort of uh, scientific conversations. Half of the respondents crudely put, basically thought it was brilliant because it was speeding up um, the process of communicating. It meant you could, you could go around the sides of journalists who might either block you or be unable to represent the story adequately, etc. Um, and that you had your, you could develop your own channels to communicate directly with your own audiences, you know, the usual kind of evangelical stuff around social and digital. And then there was half response, quite a lot more than we anticipated, who thought this was a bit of a challenge actually, and that, again, it goes back to the mediated stuff, the journalist being in the middle actually was a quality control mechanism. And, um, you know, I remember one particular respondent, I did some of these interviews, and one one very senior respondent running a major agency talking to me about how actually it was just a license for people who didn't know very much to pretend that they did and get on the same channel. It was very hard for the general public to distinguish between nutters and authority. And there's a problem there for controversial science because 
you you know in the swamp that is social media it's very difficult uh, one might argue for an the uninitiated to tell wood from the from the cedar trees so um, you know to see what what's authority and what isn't out there I disagree with that point personally I think that the general public is a little bit more savvy but then again the other day I bought a desk from a company that didn't exactly exist and I'm gonna to have to go and talk to the fraud police about that so there we are <laughs> <laughs> investment benefit communications oh yeah this is really interesting particularly in relation to your role as funders of science assuming most of you guys are from research council just how annoyed uh, senior practitioners were, well actually everybody was with the government really <laughs> in the sense of government plays a sort of five-year game of investment and plays a short game and you know you have these national campaigns that last for two or three years when actually persuading people about the benefit of scientific investment is a long game and requires a reputation lag and the way that we believe things requires considerable investment over time Give an example, if you look at apprenticeships as a model, you know, it, it took about 10 years of investment for that, for, uh, in, in, in communication as well as structural stuff, but it took a very long time to, to relaunch that as a sort of proposition in the public psyche. So I could understand that. And I think, every, there's some, again, I'd, I'd really, um, I'd recommend the section on that that's in the, it's, a, it's called the Qualitative Study, the Senior Practitioner Study on the CRPR website, again we'll send a link. I recommend that as a bit, as a section to just read on its own because there were some really wise things said by, said by practitioners. So, what's the solution to all these problems? According to practitioners, it's pretty much three things. Um, they really like STEMPRA at a certain level, but practitioners above a certain level thought that they didn't have very many networks to get together. They thought that they were that it was a specialism of sorts um, and what they really wanted in terms of development was peer-to-peer -peer conversations so um, to meet like-minded people and talk through how did, how did you solve that problem how did you how did you get that stakeholder on board how did you persuade your managing director not to do that how did you you know impose an ethical framework where there wasn't one before or etc um, lobbying and that was more about um, there's quite an appetite for collective lobbying on behalf of scientific institutions for things that matter to you all collectively. Probably at the moment, you probably want to be thinking about Saeed Javid and the business government research. You know, uh, if I were, if I could magically bring you all into a cohesive whole, that's probably where I would recommend you might. You know, UK are doing a good job on it actually, I have to say. Uh, and sharing best practice um, in the. Again, through mostly through the networking kind of stuff, and actually um, getting to the point where you you could say I'm a science public relations professional, I'm a cohesive identity. Very very quickly to give you a little bit of extra reward for for, for being here, I did a piece of work as well for the Universe, University Alliance on the REF, which obviously you guys are are, are involved in as funders of. Um, of um, institutions through the REF. I'm not going to go in a huge amount of detail, but so this is this is allied to this kind of um, this issue. It's worth just pointing out about all the stuff that's come out. There's the Rand report, there's the King's stuff that comes from King's College, a guy called Jonathan Graham, and it all says the same kind of stuff, which is that the big the, the, the universities are really struggling <coughs> to evidence impact and return on investment of the money you give them. Or the money government gives them, and that you advise, and that you, you're involved in that process. And this is really interesting. One of the biggest problems that universities have, they're embarrassed to go back to research users or clients and say, "How did it go? Yeah, can we have a sort of testimonial for you, from you?" And it's a, it was incredible. This was a big. This was a study done by Hefke. Again, this sort of. This um, summed up some of the evidence challenges um, in terms of, um, which I won't rehearse, in terms of um, the ref. But what's my point of, before we go on to the last bit? Um, I don't think that unis are going to fix this problem by 2020. There are some parts of academia who feel this. This is a quote from a leading 
scientist at one of the universities involved in the Hefke research. What is it? You know, it's a disruption. Also, the mechanisms for incentivizing academics to record um, the impact of their research in a meaningful way are not yet in place. So it's, there's not... So what's this got to do with you guys? It's an opportunity, actually. It's a development opportunity. They've got time to get it in place by, uh, by 2020. Obviously, you've got to start collecting your evidence ASAP. It's a lag of about seven to eight years. So actually, they should have started collecting their, their evidence about 2012. Sorry, 2012. I just I wanted to raise that because it's a, it's a major issue coming up. A couple of other things. Um, we developed a working group uh, off the back of the research and um, we, we're, we're looking at a variety of different activities. Um, I've mentioned some of these. Obviously one of the big things that's been happening um, since we, we ran the report is Alex Aitken and his gang in, in government and the government communication service. And they are the changes that they've made in terms of um, evaluation and measurement which applies to people working in for instance, um, uh, communicating science on behalf of the government, which I think is, in personally, I think one of the biggest changes in the last decade in terms of professional practice. A good example of that is, bizarrely, a friend of mine who just happens to be, it's just a personal friend, she's got no, I never worked with her or anything, called Sarah Gibbons, who won the, who happens to be comms director in the Department of Health, um, and won the CIPR and AMEC award this year for their Ebola communications and the measurement around that. So if you want a case study of good practice, I'd really recommend that. Lastly, so just go back to one of our major findings, which was that senior level networking, and there was no, there's no qualifications for science communications, uh, oh, science public relations, sorry, there's lots of science communications qualifications, but public there's, there's a gap. Why do we know that? Well, obviously that's what our respondents said, but uh, the, net, the, the working group for, from the CIPR that's taken on some of the research findings asked Bournemouth Uni, a lady called Natasha Tobin at Bournemouth Uni, to go away and um, look, do an audit of training and networking and conference, stuff like that. Um, if you're interested, I've got a whole audit, so I've got a massive spreadsheet of all the different training, because actually some of that training you might not know about, but there is a gap. There's a big gap in the middle, and this is where <coughs> the gap is. according to the, this audit. What we've decided to do is explore the possibility of at least running an event or a conference to try and fill some of these gaps. So our research identified a bit of a problem by our respondents. This research has tried to pinpoint that. We need someone other than the CIPR to support it because if you remember back to the original results, quite a lot of science communicators don't identify themselves as being anything to do with the CIPR. 